first let me briefly introduce myself. It's a slide with a lot of text. Now I reckon it, but um, I'm Neil Stanis and I work as a researcher for Vericode. Uh, I've got a background in .NET development, started out with the first bits of .NET in the early 2000s, and then moved on to pen testing, security consultancy, ethical hacking. And I mostly nowadays focus on static analysis of .NET applications and what we do. If you want to know more about Vericode, come see our booth, it's just outside this door. And I do a lot of public speaking where I want to talk to developers to make sure that, hey, I'm a big fan of new technology, like WebAssembly has got some real good stuff in it, and I want everybody to use it in the most safe way, in a way that, um, yeah, everybody can do the stuff that they want, right? And technology should not hold you back. That's one of my takes on it. And because of my public speaking, Microsoft awarded me MVP. I'm really happy about that. It helps me also to connect with them and to make sure that I'm aware of all the stuff that they're doing. But that's enough said, enough plugging. WebAssembly, next, ne next topic. So if you look on what, um, on the website itself in 2017, WebAssembly was released as MVP as well, but then it was minimal viable product, right? The first release that they did into the four major browsers. And it, it is like a, a portable compilation target, which has like, which, which is well performing and runs inside the browser. That was like one of the major goals that they had. And moving on, and when that was released, what was the first thing that we saw happening with apps? So. You can take a tool called mscripten, which is a compiler that takes existing C code and compiles it into WebAssembly. And what people from AutoCAD has done, and I think also Adobe has several of these kinds of things, they've taken their existing apps and converted them to WebAssembly to run inside your browser. So if you're an engineer that needs to do drawings of buildings or some mechanics or whatever, you can use AutoCAD inside your browser, which I think is pretty cool. That shows the potential because also the fact that it was high performant, it, it can do stuff with the GPU inside the browser. It can, it can do stuff in an efficient way. It opened up doors for doing this. So that's pretty cool. What else did we see after that is WebAssembly is also a lot used as an SDK for SDKs. And the funny fact is that because it's a compilation target, both Amazon and Disney Plus use it in their video apps. So the fact that Amazon can release to 8,000 devices all at once is because of the WebAssembly target that they do, right? Which is pretty cool. And they also allow you to easily integrate the stuff with your own things. It's because it's an SDK for SDKs. So that opens up a lot of doors as well. So everybody's already using it. And that makes it, I think, a cool technology. And at that point in time, I thought like, okay, if we look at WebAssembly in general, we're gonna dig into its design principles and what makes it secure, right? I want you to then, well, then we're gonna move to like, we're gonna run some stuff on it and see how it internally works and how it is running, let's say Python, Go, and Rust, and you're gonna see a lot of .NET today because hey, that's the thing I'm comfortable with, but I'm gonna show you Python and Rust as well. We're gonna work on that. We're then gonna take some of the things that WebAssembly runtimes provide us and extend an application with it, and then do some fun stuff with what it's allowed to do or not. And then at the end, we're also gonna see like what's next. If we have this WebAssembly type, what's next for us? Um, and it has to do with cloud and compute, it's really cool. And then at the end, hopefully conclusion, as I said, I will make sure I'm on time for lunch, otherwise I will be around for questions and answers afterwards. The WebAssembly design, there were four major points when I started out. First, they said it needs to be fast, efficient, and portable. It needs to be executed in near native speed across all different platforms, right? It needs to be readable and debuggable. So it's a, a, a low level bytecode if you look into it, but there's also a readable text format of WebAssembly that you can easily read through and then still it's operations on numerical values, so there's not much to gain from it, but you can look into it and you can read it. It needs to be kept secure. And of course, in a browser, it's pretty easy. If you have same origin, if a thing gets rendered in a context, then most of the stuff should be sorted out. If the thing wants to communicate with stuff that's with the browser, let's say upload files, it needs to interact with the browser. So all the same things applies as any other regular website, right? And the other thing is that it should not break the web. And the thing with that is that, um, in the early days when we had like browser wars and browsers were fighting over each other, uh, if one of them broke the web in some way, you would lose users, right? Everybody would move to the other browser and you would lose your user base, which is not a good thing. And that's the whole thing with web, of course, right? We need to keep backwards compatibility in order for everything to work, which from security perspective is sometimes a bit of a headache, but that's one of the rules that they also wanted to do with WebAssembly. And as I said, it's a bytecode type of thing. So it's a binary instruction format for a stack-based virtual machine, which is similar to the JVM with bytecode and with .NET when it runs IL. And it needs to be defined as a portable compilation target. So you're gonna write Rust, Go, 
JavaScript, you're going to do C Sharp, you're going to target WebAssembly, and you're not going to like, uh, it's, it's, it's something you target, it's not something that you write yourself. And the other thing, if that you look at the security model that they defined, it needs to protect users from buggy modules. So if somebody has a module and their supply chain gets compromised, we've seen talks around supply chain over, over the last days, right? Um, you need to make sure that you can protect the users that use the software. And the other thing I also find important is that you need to provide useful primitives to the, to the developers that are using your libraries, meaning that, and I'm going to give another, another example, but if you want to suppress certificate validation in .NET, the API you need to call is really explicit, and it even has the word dangerous in it, which means like, hey, if you're doing this, think twice if it's really needed, right? And I think that's also the thing they want to do with, um, with WebAssembly, and even by default, it's off, stuff is not allowed, and that makes it powerful, right? So good primitives, that helps out. So these are design principles, but then looking into WebAssembly itself, and if we have a module, what's the key thing in WebAssembly to execute? It needs memory, right? And a WebAssembly memory will always be isolated for each of the module that gets loaded, and it will have its own array of bytes available, and where data gets stored, and it cannot read across its bounds, right? It needs to stick with its own bounds. Um, the blue cartoon you see over here are code cartoons. They're being drawn by Lynn Clark. She's part of the Bytecode Alliance. I've got links in my slides, and I have a notes version that are in my GitHub repo. So at the end, if you want to have all the links, bear with me. It's in the slides. You don't need to like note it down right now. But you're going to see a lot more of those cartoons because they are nice, like in explaining how WebAssembly works and also how we're going to move forward with WebAssembly um, um, in the next couple of months. So. Memory is important, right? Not exceeding the bounds. It will take care of a lot of security problems that we know. Um, what else do we need? Because a module itself can still have some uh, vulnerability or maybe some malicious stuff that's happening, which, which allows it to mingle with its own memory, allows it to screw up its own memory, right? We need to have something additionally on top of that to make that secure. And that is something they call control flow integrity, right? And what it means is like, I was thinking like, how can I explain this? And, this is a bit of C sharp code, but I'm going to explain to you what's happening here, so bear with me. But it has to do with the fact like we have, we're going to do like a write from console, we're going to write, read a number, we're going to write it out, and then we have a condition. We're going to check if a number is greater than five or not, and we have two blocks in this code base. And then at the end, we're going to execute and wrap up with the last uh, console write line. Technically, we could chop up this code into the following like chart, like flow chart, right? We have one block, first block, that will always be executed. Then we have two possible paths based on the condition that we're going to take. And then at the end, everything comes together and the execution wraps up. This is a map. And what WebAssembly does at compile time, it will create a map from the code and it will have a list of stuff that it expects. So if you at some point have a step that it didn't expect, it will run into a trap. That's how they call it. We're going to see a trap later on as well. So that allows it to safeguard and at least reduce the risk of anything bad happening, right? I'm not gonna say it's the, it's the holy grail, but it will reduce the risk, and that's, that's cool. So the memory and the fact that it has control flow integrity. The whole way that it's built up is even uh, as good that uh, there is one project, I'm not sure, like, many of you probably are Firefox users, I'm fi using Firefox myself as well. You're relying on something called a rel box, which is already doing a lot of good stuff with WebAssembly inside. So, Together with the university, they created this project. And what they do is that if you have a browser, there's a lot of rich content that needs to be rendered, like fonts and videos, and they use plugins for it. And those plugins are written in C code. And we know what can happen with C code if it's not written well, right? Security pops, like there might be a vulnerability. We can do some, some overruns and we can maybe execute code. That might be it, right? In the early days when browser had a single process, it was even worse. But they wanted to do something about it. So what they did is they took those C code bases, they moved it into, compiling it into WebAssembly. And then said so like, okay, so now we can safeguard behind the fact that we have that memory that I just talked about, and that we can enforce stuff with those control flow integrity maps that we also generate at the compile time. Then they concluded like, but we're not gonna ship WebAssembly modules inside of Firefox. We want to still have a C code base that we compile from. So what they then do, and this is where the cool stuff happens, they com convert it back to C code. And then that C code is included in the code base. And on top of that, they also mark the library as being untrusted. So the data flow, if you have a plugin, data goes in, right? It needs to do stuff, and then it returns data. Those data paths are being like wrapped around as being tainted. 
And the compiler would instruct you that you first need to validate the data that comes back from that component that executed before you can continue, right? And that's helping the developers and say like, hey, I need to validate this data, make sure that it doesn't exceed this link or doesn't, uh, it, it, that the data meets my expectations, right? That's, that's the take on it. So uh, this is pretty cool. They leverage WebAssembly in such a way and they rely on those constructs I just mentioned and then they move it back to C code and include it in Firefox and you're using it, right? For, I think it's font rendering, there are a couple of other libraries. You can find it, you can find the Firefox uh, Arrowbox website um, in the links. So now let's move on. Let's, let's start to run stuff on WebAssembly because that's what I said, that was the first thought, right? If you do stuff with data and analytics, you probably used uh, Jupyter Notebooks. And Jupyter Notebooks technically is a Python runtime that runs on WebAssembly. If you then look inside the browser and look, in, look like what gets downloaded, you will see that there's a, st a list of stuff that gets downloaded, like all the files it needs. And there's a Python runtime being downloaded, a WASM file that starts out the Python stuff, and they created a way of dealing with Python libraries in such a way that it runs inside this context. And then you can just run Python and do all the stuff, right? So you can just do the code with the data you have at that point in that notebook, which is pretty powerful. And because I'm, as I said, I'm a .NET guy, I'm also gonna briefly touch how you can run .NET on WebAssembly because that's also already done. Looking at it technically, you can even say this might be a Java code base for the same reason. We have user code, so code you write yourself, which is like Java or C Sharp, that gets compiled into that IL stuff. We have the base class library, that are the things that we need in order to access system files, uh, maybe do an HTTP client, do logging, that kind of things. Those basic stuff is in there. Then we have the execution engine, and in .NET, that's the CLR that starts out all the things are in, in, in the Java world is the JVM that executes it and that will run on the machine. How are we able to have this kind of stack if it's like .NET or Java and I run this on WebAssembly? We might are able to change the execution engine and say, hey, if we take out this one and compile this into WebAssembly, we can do this. And that's exactly what they've done with Blazor WebAssembly for .NET. So the mono runtime was written in C code and that mono runtime was then ported to WebAssembly and could run inside the browser. And if you, this is like the typical .NET new Blazor app. If you run this, if you then look into the files that get downloaded, you will see that there's a .NET WASM file. That's the CLR that runs on .NET. And you see all, all the DLLs that, that you, like that belong to your app that will be run on top of it. So this is how they run .NET inside the browser. There's also ways of doing ahead of time and moving more stuff into WebAssembly space, which might be something you would consider for, uh, for performance. But technically, if you have one code base, you can run this on a app that's native to a client, and you can also run it inside the browser, and it will look the same, right? That's one of the goals. But keep in mind that we just take out the host, or like we have, we have taken out the CLR, and what if we want to get rid of the browser, right? We want to run WebAssembly on our system in the same way what you just saw. We need to have a replacement for the host and we don't have availability of the browser. And this is where, um, in 2019, the Bytecode Alliance introduced something called WebAssembly System Interface. And it's a POSIX-inspired, engine independent non-system-oriented web API for WebAssembly, which technically is like taking out all the host APIs you need and put it into an abstraction layer. And what they've also done is they've taken a runtime implementation as a reference, WASM time. We're gonna see WASM time execute in the demos. But that's the reference implementation that will run WebAssembly in combination with WASM and, and WASI combined. And it will give us a lot of good things. It will also give us, and now the security parts come in, a strong sandbox with capability-based stuff that we can toggle along the way. And right now, we, I'm, I'm running stuff on Preview 1. Next week, there is KubeCon and Cloud Native Day, and I'm expecting there's gonna be a Preview 2 release, which has a lot more tooling already in place. But conceptually, what I'm gonna show is, is the same. And there's a lot of ceremony code, which we're gonna skip, and it's gonna be much more lightweight. But right now you can lock down file systems, but you're also gonna be doing the same with sockets and every resource you need on the system. So I think that's powerful, right? Being able to control what a library is allowed to do or not to do. And people with .NET knowledge, they probably are familiar with NetStandard. It's almost like the same type of layer. We have that unified stuff that we happen to need to in order to move .NET forward. And this is similar, but then in order to run on WebAssembly on a system and take it outside the browser. How big is WASI? This is a tweet that was done by Solomon Hikes. You probably know him as the guy that started out Docker. And he said like, if WASI would have existed at the time that we were creating Docker, Docker would not be here. Because um, 
it, it takes away the need of doing that. This was one day. He probably got a lot of angry phone calls of people poking him <laughs> because the next day he tweeted this. He said like, okay, will it replace Docker? He's just like, no, it's not the case. It's gonna be something that will run next to it, right? So it will help us out doing different workloads. Sometimes in the container, sometimes a micro VM, WebAssembly based, that might help out. What did we see last year at KubeCon? Exactly what he said. I'm not sure, I, I, think it, I, I don't think he's involved with Docker anymore, but last year they released a technical preview of Docker that runs WebAssembly modules, and in the right pillar you see uh, a WASM Edge, which is a WASM like uh, runtime similar as WASM time that does the same WASM stuff. So wrapping up, I'm going to move to code because I want to see, I want to show you stuff and, uh, and how it works. If we want to do this outside the browser, we need to replace uh, the host with WASM WASM time. And luckily, the guy who also created Blazor was kind enough to create an SDK that allows us to do it with .NET. And that's the thing I'm gonna do right now. So bear with me when I switch to my VS Code. And I'm hoping that this is big enough. Should I increase the font a bit or is this good enough to read? Yeah? Otherwise I can always, let's make sure once more and then should be fine either way. So this is just an ordinary console app if you're doing .NET development. And if you're not a .NET developer, I will talk through what happened. Don't worry about that. And we're, um, I added a package in this case that refers to the SDK that will allow me to do a WASI compliant uh, WebAssembly module. So that's the thing I'm gonna do. So if I now decide to do a .NET build, you will see that I'm questioning also, show me the OS architecture that this runs on, right? Because that, that hopefully will be different. If I then run the binary itself, as how I compile it on my machine, you will see it runs on ARM64, which is my Mac, my M2 Mac that's on this desk right here. If I now decide I want to do it based on the .NET stuff that I'm running, you will see, hey, this is different. This is running on WebAssembly. So the same DLL, in this case, running on my system or running on the WebAssembly runtime. Okay, now what, Niels? Let's say if we want to access files, right? As I said before, I want to have a file and I want to read the contents. Let's say read all texts. Read all texts, yes. And I'm gonna read the file called etc slash hosts on my machine. There's nothing sensitive in that, so it should be fine there, uh, writing it down. So that's what I'm gonna do next, right? I'm gonna say, hey, write it out to the console and give me that results. Save it. Let me do a .NET build to make sure my fat fingers didn't fail me. It's fine. If I now run the binary, right? This is the .NET app that runs native on my machine. You will see it has read my file from my system. If I now want to do the same with the .NET WebAssembly one, which is .NET run, you will see it will miserably fail with a really big stack trace saying like, hey, I'm trying to access files a save handle has been closed. This is quite obscure uh, thing. The SDK one is a preview that they created with .NET 8. There's like a template that will do a much better job. I haven't moved to 8 yet for demos because there's always demos guts that will screw up. So I, I stuck with this one, but it should be almost the same. So if I now want to have access to files, I need to explicitly say that. So my .NET run underneath the hood does use WASM time. And if I now say I'm going to run my WASM assembly, and I'm gonna say, hey, you're allowed to read the etc folder, because that's where the file is located. You will see I'm allowed to do it, right? This is the exact same WebAssembly module, but it will read that file. And that's only because I instructed the host in time, say like, hey, this module is allowed to open this folder and read files from it, right? So that's technically the baseline of the sandboxing you have in preview one. So this gets us somewhere. And I said to you, what about other languages, right? Because Niels.net, I'm more like a Python guy. Let's go to a Python example, which is the same. And I'm gonna briefly, just quickly show you what's happening here. I don't want to have the F file, don't save. Cool, so close this one. Let me see those files here. No, once more code, oh, my current folder. We have this, let me collapse. If I open the file, let me collapse that one. So, like this. So this is almost, I'm not a Python expert, but I can write this, right? This is taking the platform, writing it out, and then it wants to open my file on my system the same way we saw before. If I now say Python 3, I've, no, I've locally installed on my machine, and I say demo, I need to make sure that I'm in the right folder, hold on. 
This is the one. Yes. And then I'm going to say Python 3 and demo.py. It will read that file. If I now want to do the same with WASM time, I need to, of course, say, I'm going to say WASM time run python.wasm um, over here is a uh, Python runtime that runs WASI in the same way. And let's say I'm going to take uh, demo.py. First, it will miserably fail because Python itself needs to have write access to the folder. We have seen it before, right? So it needs to have file access to its own, to its own stuff. Let me quickly copy that one over here. This is the right command. And in this case, we're running it inside of a, of a WASI based Python runtime, right? Which also has file access because I granted it file access once it started out based on this command, right? So you'll find these demos inside the repo with the commands I just mistyped. That's why I copied it, right? That's why you have notes inside your demos. Um, so it works like that. So I think this is pretty, pretty cool. Now let's move on to the extending part because as I said, you can also take WebAssembly and run it inside your application. And if you have seen all the restrictive stuff that we've done, there's more that we can do. So let me move to a code base, which is called extend. And I have created a Rust module, and we're going to talk through a bit what that Rust module does. Let me collapse this, hold on. So what we see here is a bit of Rust code. And if you do like Java or C Sharp, you probably are familiar with what you see here, right? Where we have a main routine that will read arguments from the command line. And then above this function, it's called process. It will copy files. We're going to do stuff with copy files again. But as I said, there's, there's more to this demo. We're going to try that. And once that like fails or not, we're going to see error messages pop up or not. So this is a module. I'm going to compile this into a WebAssembly module. And as you've seen, I, I already had it collapsed when I started out but there's a built output folder that will have a, a WASM file that I'm going to take to another project. Let's move to that one. And this is the folder already, so that looks good to me. So I have copied that module that I compiled with Rust, moved it here. And now I'm going to start out. And WASM time also comes with a package that allows you to embed the runtime in each of your applications, right? So, and this is exactly what I have done over here. So I've just taken the WASM time package reference and included it in my .NET app. You can do this on, as I said, on Python and all the stuff. If you go to WASM time, their website, you will find which of the packages are available. And then we're going to start out running things. And now, as I said, there's a lot of ceremony, but I will talk you through. So first of all, because we're going to start WASM time in the context, we need to configure stuff. So we need to define, I'm going to reroute some stuff, uh, standard error, standard output, in order to make sure that we see stuff that's happening. Then we need to configure something with engines and linkers and stores. Then we're going to load the module from former file. And then we're going to instantiate our main function and execute this. This is a lot of ceremony. Preview 2 will do a much better job. But this was the baseline that we can do right now. If I right now say, OK, need to make sure I'm in the right folder. Hold on. This is the right one. If I now say .NET build, and I want to say .NET run, and I'm going to give a file, which again is my etc hosts file, and I want to copy it to hosts, you will see that luckily this runtime embedded inside my app is a lot more like descriptive in what it tells me. It's just like, hey, it, it, you failed to pre-open or you have no access to these files. So what we can do here is we're going to uh, instruct our convict to say, hey, I want you to do a with pre-open directory and say, hey, we have etc. You can map etc. You can even do aliasing if you want to, to another location. I can open it. And I can also, I also want to have access to my own directory where the uh, application runs. And by default, that's also, that's, that's denied. You need to do that, right? Secure defaults. That's what we want. So if you do this and save again, let me go back to my build, see if I may no typing errors with my first fingers, and then run host, and it didn't complain. And if we then look into the directory itself, we will see it did copy the host file, right? So in this case, we're able to take a module that is written in all the languages that you just want, if it compiles to WebAssembly, and you can integrate it, and you can do the same limitations. 
There's also a way of saying, hey, I know that this module will consume X amount of memory and I never want it to exceed that amount of memory. You can configure and instruct this runtime saying, hey, don't exceed that amount of memory. Another concept it has is called fuel. And each operation in WASM time is consuming fuel. And we can turn on the fuel gauge and say like, hey, we want to make sure that we stay within the bounds of not like consuming more fuel than 50,000, which is just like, it's just like a, a, me a measurement. It's not that it's each operation, but there is some kind of measurement. But if a module runs consistently, there's probably a value you can stick to, right? Say like, hey, and if a module becomes malicious and does more things, there's probably more operations happening, right? And that's, that, that's something you can uh, um, reduce the risk of. So let me now do a .NET build once more. Make sure that we delete this file and we can do a .NET run again. We will see, I didn't save this, hold on, yes. Let's do the .NET build again, let's do the .NET run. Make sure we delete the file. I've done this demo a couple of times. So you can see consumed fuel, it says 35,000. That's the amount of ticks it took. What if I say, hey, I don't want you to exceed uh, 500, which is of course an arbitrary number that doesn't make sense, but let's say we, we want to limit it and, and want to do that. We're gonna do a .NET build again. We're gonna do .NET run. We're gonna see it runs into a trap. And this is one of the trap I mentioned before even with execution, right? So all fuel was consumed, right? This gives you control over the compute that executes this module. I think this is quite powerful. Yes, there's a lot of ceremony, there's a lot of code around it, but as I said, that, that definitely is gonna be better. And let me move on a bit. So we saw the OSI SDK, we saw this demo where I took all the, the parts and put them together. So now we are able to compile WebAssembly and run it on a WASI compliant runtime. What else can we do? Let's move into something called trusted computing. Trusted computing or confidential computing. Um, if you go to XKCD, you will find this graph and I like this one. It, it explains like what are the layers, if you run stuff on cloud, what are the layers that you need to be worried about? Right? You can have a current employee that might compromise that layer or somebody that is like a, a former one, <laughs> it might be the case. And underneath we have some nation state that's involved or a hardware vendor that's screwed up, right? These are all the layers. If you run stuff on Azure, AWS, Google Cloud, these are the risks that you might need to consider of like, hey, do I want this or not? Some people from Red Hat moved to a project and they created something called Enarchs. And Enarchs is a WASI compliant runtime that runs on a T, and a T is a trusted execution environment that stands next to your CPU and is isolated from everything and how it works. And the cool thing is that because it's compliant with WASI, you can, once you compile something to WASI, you can run it in that, in that same confidential space. And Enarchs, they got real, some real good documentation. You can find the threads that they want to like, have covered, like they don't trust the host, they don't trust the owner, the operator. You are able to verify like the chip itself because it needs to be signed by the manufacturer, right? And also the software that runs it and Enarchs itself is worth some time with additional stuff tied to it. It's got some metrics and some calculations that you can use, some heuristics you can look into once it starts out. And it allows you to, to do some attestations and say like, hey, is this, is this the right runtime? Am I, am I confident that I can continue? That's exactly what it covers. And on top of that, this is a layer like, I'm not gonna bother you with all the things, but you see that there's WASI and WASM involved. And it's, it's, ex it's executed in such a low place against your CPU, it allows you to do trusted computing. Unfortunately, Enarx uh, had a company which is called Proofian, which was like the commercial uh, counterpart of this open source project, and they stopped business at the beginning of this year. The project is still part of the confidential computing uh, group, which is like Linux Foundation. And luckily, when I was looking at build last year, Microsoft, uh, Mark Zosinovich showed a thing called Project Hyperlite, where he says, okay, we want to have sandboxing for multi-concurrency, but they want to have almost similar pillars you saw with Docker, right? They want to be able to do virtual machines, containers, and WebAssembly modules or micro VMs. And they're really investing in the whole confidential computing parts. And Mark Krasinovich even said, like, I want everybody by default just to run their workloads like this. Like, why not, right? If we can do this, 
It's the same with doing like Let's Crypt for your website or doing Six Store if you need to sign artifacts. It's there, everybody can use it. Why not like do it like that and make that the default? That's good. And some other people within Microsoft also had some really cool projects. So Steve Sennett and the guy on the left, he started out Blazor, but he has shown a thing called .NET Isolator, which takes .NET and then a WebAssembly runtime and runs .NET inside of it, which of course, like, why do you want that? Because it's fun, I've done the same. And I run into his demos, I'm like, this is cool because I've been thinking about concepts on sandboxing within .NET, it's hard, but this will make it possible. So within the demos, there's one demo that I'm also using that .NET Isolator, you can run it yourself if you're interested. And the second one you see on the right side is um, uh, one of the developers of Hyperlite, and he has a really nice talk on WASMCon where he explains like why they think this type of workloads are the one moving forward. And he also explains what WebAssembly makes secure. He has some real cool stuff where he shows at some point they found a vulnerability in module memory that was allowing to do a cross read across modules and they fixed it of course, but then they introduced the hypervisor as additional security layer. So I would definitely encourage you to go to that WASMCOM talk if you're interested in what the next confidential computing stuff would be. Um, as I said before, you've seen the demos, a lot of ceremony. If we look at WebAssembly, what's next? This drawing might like maybe not everybody agrees with it, but let's say a big portion of the code that we use is code that doesn't belong to us or that we use from others. I'm lazy as well, you're developing stuff you want to reuse that's already there. If we then have a list of a tree of dependencies, also with a .NET application, right, the, the process starts and every DLL or every module that gets loaded will have access to all the system resources. The same as the process has, right? The keys will just be delegated. Hey, you can get access, you can, everybody has access. What if one of the modules, one of the transitive ones, has a problem and becomes malicious, so puts on a mask and wants to do some stuff? It's a, it has access to all those things. It can read environment variables, it can read the file system, it, it can do anything, right? So then we have that need for that sandbox. Or if there is a vulnerability in the module and somebody from the outside can influence it, right? That, that's the third alternative. So what will be, uh, approach forward if we look at the whole modules and how they can limit access. We can do process isolation. And this is of course um, some overload because if multiple processes needs to communicate with each other, a browser does it, right? There's a, there's a communication channel in between those processes in order to communicate. There's a lot of overhead because um, the, the, the plus side is that memory is isolated but there's overhead. We want to have a different approach and this one there's a small asterisk at the bottom saying like this is not drawn at scale, which is of course a joke, but you see if you have two WebAssembly modules, it's better to have like a, a nano process, that's how they call that concept underneath the hood. And one of the nano process things would be the sandboxing thing, you just saw me do in code. I can, give this I can give this module, this component access to this, and that's the only thing you're gonna do, nothing more, nothing less. We still have the guarantee with WebAssembly that it can only access its own memory, nothing else. If it needs to interchange types, do we need some help? And interface types, that's the thing that comes with preview too, which are like the, 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 the contracts that are code generated and that you could just use. You don't need to do all the mingling I was doing within my code, at least not for invoking and transiting data from one module to another, so that's cool. And the other thing, and this is the one that I'm really excited about, you can do that whole sandboxing stuff, fine, finely grained, resulting in something that gets locked down and it doesn't have access to. And then the missing link would be, there needs to be some module that orchestrates it all, that starts it out, and then you can delegate the keys, and then you have like the safest solution, right? That will be it, this is what they call the nano process, or the WebAssembly component model. And this is a talk that was done by Luke Wagner, also at WebAssembly, at WASMCon, I think it was Seattle in September, and um, he explains exactly this. He also explains how the tooling is gonna work and how you can have imports and exports but the whole component model also allows you to wrap a module with another module. So let's say I have a module that I rely on from a third party and I know it's only in need for reading certain files and it needs to have access to the internet to certain locations. You can create wrappers around that module and then put it in and that's the whole declarative way of defining a sandbox, right? You rely on the code that's written but you have control as a developer to decide what it's allowed to do or not. And as I said, the preview too, I, I'm, I'm I'm assuming it will hit next week that they're gonna release it, but there is a project called Wazi Vert that does that whole adapter thing for you. So you can just say this module 
can only access a virtual file system that I'm going to give it right now. And this is the implementation, but that module can still be run in an application that has full system access. There's no, there's no problem with that. And this is what that component model gives us. Now you could still question, have we seen this before? And people who have been around a while probably know Corba, Digom, and even if you look at the whole uh, uh, security model, .NET access security, code access security was something that got pretty close. Those concepts were like almost the same. I think with code access security, it was too complex, too big, and it was just flipping a mutex and user space to turn it off. So that's not a good security countermeasure, right? But the other ones, Look Wagner says, it's not about distributed components because we're gonna do it in one single process, right? And that's the thing. If you do microservices, you need to have infrastructure. WebAssembly modules are much smaller and will be able to communicate with each other with all the security benefits you just saw. Then there's always that um, exception to the rule or something you need to be aware of, right? And at the end, um, all of this is of course as secure as the WebAssembly runtime is. And this is of course, this is a key, this is the thing you need to keep in mind. And if I look at security uh, things that were published, let me see, I think um, last year Black Hat, there was not a lot of them WebAssembly, but the year before, most of it was mostly focused on fuzzing of runtimes. And yes, that's good, we need to do that because we need to make sure that the runtime executes uh, in a good way. But th that's, that's about it. And the cool thing is that the Bytecode Alliance, um, there's a guy called Nick Fitzgerald who is focusing on security and he has a nice blog post where he explains why WASM time is really secure because they you write a lot of Rust. There's not a lot of unsafe code, right? Unsafe code in Rust, that's, that's the exception to the rule. Um, and it uses all the language uh, security features. Control for integrity is also part of that one. Um, and they use continuous fuzzing on, on uh, all of it. And they have disclosure, of course, uh, responsible disclosure. You can disclose your vulnerabilities with them. And they're open and transparent about this. And if you don't want to read that whole blog post, you can also listen to him talking about this. So at WASMCon, he had the same uh, talk or he explained to exactly what, what was happening and also how they disclose some of the things uh, with, that, with that WASM runtime in order to make sure that it's secure. They're doing some real cool stuff. One of the projects is also uh, collectively reviewing uh, crates within Cargo, Cargo Vet. It's, it's a real cool approach. I would love to see that on more ecosystems and allow you to know that, hey, did somebody review this component, right? You want to collectively look at the components and say this is wrong or this is right, or this has some smelly code in it because its supply chain had some things happening that you're not aware of, right? There's a lot of good stuff in there, but I would surely uh, like you to go to that one. And next week, Cloud Native Wasm Day has a lot of security on the agenda already, so I'm looking forward. Those videos are online like the same day almost, or streamed live, so keep your eye out on that. It's uh, one of their YouTube channels. And with um, a couple of minutes open, and then if there are questions, I'm gonna open up for that. So I think in general, um, the whole cloud, now the cloud native space and WebAssembly is gonna be there, and it's gonna be used in that space a lot. Another company is called Cosmonic. They have Wasm Cloud, which is a WebAssembly runtime that runs on top of the cloud that has all the same goodness you saw already. And they have got some real cool demos where they show already previews to stuff that they use. So look into that. I think it has a lot of potential if you run it inside your app, especially if you do composite apps, right? You can reuse stuff, build once, run everywhere. And it's as still as secure as the runtime implementation. But I do like the fact that the Bytecode Alliance is taking the top-down approach. So they show you like, this is how we think it's supposed to work and then they have some cycles. You also have people on the other end saying like, it's not going fast enough, but yeah, that's, that's one of the downsides. You, they want to do it right at first. That's what they always say. Um, so it will take some time, but we will get there. I think the preview tool will give enough flexibility for everybody to start using it in a better fashion. And hopefully I can create more like appealing demos and showing how it works. So. As I said, I've got my, all my demos in my GitHub repo. That's the first one on top of it. You can reach me at my Veracode email or at, on Mastodon. And um, with five minutes left for questions, I'm gonna say thank you for uh, your attention and staying in this room. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. And if there are any questions, um, I'm, I think there's like a microphone or not. And I'm not completely sure. Yeah, there's a subfolder called slides, and, the, and we have the notes. I have the notes version that has all the links in it, and the one that has the PDF with the slides you just saw. Then I'm just going to say a wrap up and thank you. Thank you for being here and see you around, and I'm going to stay here for questions. So enjoy the conference.